Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this EBF session. My name is Michael Barham. I'm the COO with the Emma Bowen Foundation. We're really glad to have all of you joining. And we are also recording this so folks who aren't able to join today, we know it's late August, can check this out in the future and learn a little bit about how to make your application with the Emma Bowen Foundation stand out. That's really the purpose of this. We want to give you some tips and tricks. And that's what we're going to be doing today. So I'll, I'll go a little bit into detail, some logistical things to keep in mind. Um, so we are going to focus on three areas specifically of your application. So one is your resume. We want to make sure your resume is tight. Obviously, it's going to work for us, but hopefully it'll also benefit you in the long run. Similar with LinkedIn, we want to make sure your LinkedIn's, we know a lot of you, you're just getting your career started. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with LinkedIn as a platform, but we really want to talk about how you can make sure your LinkedIn looks right and has critical key information that will stand out to us, stand out to prospective employers. And we're going to talk about your HireVue video interview. We use the HireVue platform. If you've applied in the past, you probably did a video interview with HireVue. A lot of our partner employers and employers across the country use HireVue or similar video interview platforms. So it's really good practice for you guys to get comfortable with that because it, it'll be something you'll probably be, be using throughout your career. Um, so we'll give you some tips on the video interview in general too, and, and hopefully that'll apply to our our higher view platform and, and the questions we ask in particular. Um, so that's what we'll mainly focus on today. A couple of other logistical items for you guys to keep in mind. One, the application for EBF is going to launch right around Labor Day. So that's about two weeks from today. We know many of you are starting school around then. Hopefully things are a little slow, so it should give you time to complete that application. And today, like I said, we're really gonna focus on how to make your application stand out. Um, logistical questions are not really right for this session. What we'd suggest you do if you have specific questions about time frame or other specific logistical questions about your application, send them to the email applications.ebf at nbcuni.com. We're gonna put that in the chat. That will be keeping an eye on year round. So if you're watching this recording, you can also submit questions there. Um, but we will take some Q, some questions at the end. We'll do a little Q and A. We want to keep that really around how to make your application stand out. That's the focus here. We want to help you guys do the best you can with your EBF application and just as you apply to jobs in the media industry and beyond. We want to make sure you're set up for success. That's the goal here. Uh, we hope you enjoy the session. Again, if you do have to hop on early or hop off early, we're recording um, and we'll make sure this is available to uh, the audience at large so you can, you can make sure you don't miss anything. So with all that said, you're not gonna really be hearing much more from me. I am actually introducing Naina Drake. Naina is a long time member of the Emma Bowen Foundation family. She's an alum and she came through the program when, when she was maybe in for five or six years, right? As a, as a fellow and intern. Uh, she's the director of the EBF AMP network. So that's our alumni and friends network. And those of you who do end up coming through the program or you graduate from school, maybe you don't end up coming with Emma Bowen, but it is an open network. So. We encourage people of color who are in the industry, interested in the industry to join. Naina leads that. So she's there for folks to lean on as the director of our AMP network. And she also, she's a busy lady. She does a lot on the uh, production front. She is an Emmy award winner. She's producing TV shows each and every day. I don't know how she does it all, but we are also glad to have her services and for her to share some of her expertise with us and you guys and the EBF family. So welcome, Naina, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Michael. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. And congratulations to you, because this means you are serious about being a part of the EBF family. So I just want to congratulate you guys for taking the time out for yourselves to learn today. And this information is not only going to help you in our application process, but also in your career overall. So Let's go ahead and get into it. I'm gonna share my screen. So depending on how you all have the view set up, make sure that you are uh, viewing it based off of speaker format so that you can see my screen full. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and we can get into the presentation. So this is showcasing your best self, the tips for the EBF application. And like Michael said, I am Naina Drake. I am honored to be here as always, helping you all navigate this process of your career and an exciting process and journey it is. So I am here and excited to help you all. So a little bit more about me. I am an Emmy award-winning producer, writer, and entrepreneur. I was a fellow in the Emma Bourne Foundation, and that's how I got my start in the business overall. I started back a long time ago, um, and I was a high school student. So my station in Chicago was Fox Chicago. They were my partner company. I worked there all through high school, all through college. They hired me uh, before I graduated, and I ultimately ended up staying and working there in the newsroom as a producer in multiple facets. So my career has been amazing because of the Emma Bourne Foundation, and I am honored to be a director at the Emma Bourne Foundation. Now it's a full circle for me because it's given me the opportunity to make change in the industry as well as come back and help you all continue to make change. So just some of the work that I've done is listed here. And um, I am originally from Chicago, born and raised, but I'm based in Los Angeles. So uh, I am working in production as well as my position with the EBF Foundation um, in LA, but I travel all over as needed. So enough about me, let's get into this application. So um, there are specific components to the application process. And those include your application form, your resume, your LinkedIn profile with a photo, and um, all of these details should definitely be consistent across the board. You wanna make sure that your resume, your LinkedIn profile and your application, your name is consistent, all the details and information is consistent. And then once you get through that process, you will have the higher view video interview process and you will receive an email with instructions specifically on how that process goes. I'm gonna touch on some best practices and logistics on how to go about making sure that you present your best self in that aspect of the application but these are the main components of applying for our program. And I just want to underline that it is very, very important for you all to read, understand and follow all directions very carefully because we are paying attention to everyone's application as they come through and you don't wanna miss a very important step or forget to do something that we really need of you. So just make sure you guys read every aspect of that process. So let's start with the resume um, because this is a really important part of how you present yourself, not just to us, but moving forward. So we wanna make sure that you all create a clear and thorough resume overall. Make sure that your work experience is thoroughly explained and not just stating what your responsibilities were, but specifically how you created change in that position, how you impacted. Are there any numbers, specifics of, you know, you increasing, you know, engagement? If you were like a social media assistant or something, did you help launch any programs or anything like that? Give very specific examples of how you made an impact in that position. And then also make sure that you list your extracurricular activities, your leadership uh, activities, volunteer, and any act academic experience. This is really important because employers, as well as us, are taking a look at how well-rounded you are as a candidate. And we just wanna make sure that you don't just work, 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 that you have a life and that you also understand that there is a great bridge between the business of what you do and how you bring your personal self to you know, your career and your journey. And having some volunteer experience and extracurricular activities are a great way to display that. 
make sure that you are including your skills and your tech tools and programs or any software that you all are well versed in. If you are certified in a specific program, make sure that you list that. If you got any um, additional training for a specific type of program that is industry-based, such as being a graphic designer and you're certified in Adobe Suite, then that's a great example of something that you should not forget to list on your application and your resume. Um, and then make sure that it is in a PDF format. And I would definitely recommend against using a photo on your resume. I know that there have been some instances, say if you are going for something in like uh, on camera work where it is encouraged sometimes to include a photo, but standard practices for resumes are just to not use a photo because it just creates a whole nother level of um, complication sometimes when you're updating it and it's just unnecessary. You know, what you want to bring to the forefront is your skills and your experience and how you're going to make an impact at that company. So stay focused on that. So don't keep, don't put any photos on your resume. <laughs> um, make sure that you proofread and check for typos and formatting and consistencies. And it's always good, you know, we look at things a million times, but if you have another person give a second look at something that's trusted, uh, either a counselor, a teacher, um, your career services department, they will um, be able to take another look at your resume before you send it out and distribute it to anyone. So I would encourage you all to definitely make sure that you guys have someone take a second look at it. And in regards to um, specifics, this is a general template, right? So you have a lot of different options as to how your resume is formatted. I know that you can use different color blocking formats. What we recommend is just a very clean, concise, resume that lists who you are, how you can be contacted and what you're great at. So if you want to screenshot this, feel free to do so. But um, we wanna make sure like your information is consistent at the top, make sure that your LinkedIn profile is, um, is listed there and that you definitely are able to, um, you know, list your email, your phone number, uh, so that you make it easy for people to contact you. If you want to work with someone, make sure that you make it easy for them to get in touch with you to build that relationship. And your education, like I said, uh, make sure that you list this. Your GPA is always great to have listed there to show any um, awards you received, any acknowledgement for your scholar work is really, really great, um, as well as your experience list all those things in this area, your extracurricular activities, and then projects to highlight. So this is a standard format. And if you don't have a resume already structured in this way, it's best practices to you know, use a format that's simple and clean like this one. Now let's get into LinkedIn. This is so much to cover, but I'm gonna cover the basics of LinkedIn and why it's important that you create this now if you haven't already done so and that you make specific adjustments to your profile so that you present your best self, not just to us, but to everyone who's gonna see your profile. So I've heard a lot of people say, well, I don't need LinkedIn now. You know, I'm a student, I'm in school and I just don't need it yet. I'm not in the, in the workforce fully yet, but you wanna make sure that it's you have this position. This is something that you're going to need to establish before you actually need it. So just because you don't have a job doesn't mean you don't need LinkedIn. You can establish yourself very solidly as a student on LinkedIn and create great relationships so that when you are fully in the workforce that you have this already established. Now, the power of LinkedIn. There's so many great benefits to this. Um, these are just some of them that are listed because it is one of the most powerful social platforms online. Like I said, you can build your business network on LinkedIn and your network is really gonna be valuable in your longevity in this business. And even if you decide to transition out of it, your network of people that know you and that you know are gonna be able to help give you insight about salaries, negotiating, movement within the industry, company growth, opportunities, all sorts of different things. So you want to build your, your network, not just in person, but virtually and digitally too. And then you can connect with people that are not just on Instagram and Twitter. And I know that, you know, Instagram is a very solid 
form of social interaction, but LinkedIn, don't, uh, don't underestimate the power of what LinkedIn can do for you as well, because connecting with people on LinkedIn is much more professional. It definitely establishes a strong business relationship with people. Say if someone sends you a direct message on LinkedIn, usually nine times out of 10, the likelihood of that being a business opportunity or some sort of a business connection is much greater than it would be on a platform like Twitter or Instagram. So don't underestimate that. You can also land your next opportunity on LinkedIn and you can make money through LinkedIn. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. So build it before you need it. Now, how to create a powerful profile. Let's get into the details of this. What you want to do starting off is make sure that your profile picture is solid and welcoming. Make I recommend definitely to make sure that it's bright, clear, and welcoming. Smile, you know, um, and don't use a logo. If you created some sort of a business for yourself, using logos is not as personal as it is if you have a picture of yourself smiling, you know, with, you know, your photo and your face actually showing. So avoid any light logos that you may have and always present yourself. Uh, background image. By default, what LinkedIn does is create like a blue background. And if you don't have an image that displays something that is relatable to your industry or you actually working or doing something active, I will show a couple examples coming up, but it's okay to leave that blank. You like leave it as is by the default in the blue background. You don't necessarily have to um, change that if you don't have a suitable appropriate image to use. And like I said before, your name, make sure your, your name is consistent with what is listed on your resume because what people do usually when they immediately receive your resume is they automatically go to Google you or they'll look on LinkedIn to see if you have a profile. And if your name is not consistent, they're not gonna be able to find you. So you wanna make sure that your name is consistent across the board. I know some people adjust their name or they maybe they will um, use their middle name sometimes, but not, but make sure whatever you're doing on your resume is consistent and mirrors LinkedIn. Your headline, make sure this is clear and powerful. Say how you can help and actually add value to the company or anyone that wants to connect you because this is how they're going to know whether connecting with you is worth their time so make sure that you state exactly what you can do and bring to the table uh, your current position and like i said if you're a student and you're full-time in school it's okay to say that you're a student just make sure that you add specifically the, t the area of interest that you're focusing on within your studies such as marketing journalism or film directing etc and then your summary. Your summary is a, is a very important aspect of your LinkedIn profile. And I don't want you guys to miss this. I know that it uh, takes time to, to do this area of your LinkedIn profile, but it, it can add so much value to explain to people more about your personality, um, your education, your career highlights and your accomplishments that may not be listed within bullet points. So show a little bit of personality in your summary section and think of this more so as your bio or your elevator pitch. And there is a character limit. So just make sure that you get that very concisely. And then again, contact and personal information. Make it easy for people to get in touch with you. All right, so here's some examples. This is a screenshot of my LinkedIn profile page, the top of the page. And where you see the red arrows is where you adjust and edit these sections. So that top first arrow is where you can edit your background image. And uh, the, lower, the lower arrow right below that one is where you can edit the details below. LinkedIn did add a new feature that you can only access and utilize through mobile. So make sure, um, and that feature is basically your name pronunciation. Sometimes people don't pronounce my name correctly. And so I am utilizing this feature where you see the arrow on the speaker um, for LinkedIn so that when someone clicks on this, whether they're on mobile or on desktop, that they can hear the correct pronunciation of my name. Now, the way to do this is to, to do it on mobile, but it's accessible on mobile or, or desktop. So um, this is how the top of my page is viewable. It looks, um, I have a background image that's bright and corresponds with what my profile image is. I like bright colors. I think it stands out. There's so many people on LinkedIn that, you know, you wanna make sure that you stand out when people see your profile picture. 
this is another great example of using a bright picture. This is a great friend of mine who um, I went to school with. She works at Cox Media and um, she has a corresponding photo, background photo to complement her headshot. And it's her smiling, she's showing her teeth, she's welcoming, you know, she looks smart, professional. So she's, she's being playful in this, but being professional at the same time. And so these are just two examples of what you can do for your profile picture in the top of your section of LinkedIn. All right, let's get in, into the experience, accomplishments, and the other sections for your LinkedIn profile. Now, to achieve an all-star status for your profile, these are some of the recommendations that, um, that I have for you guys in regards to your experience. Like I said, everything on your resume should mirror your LinkedIn profile. But the beauty of LinkedIn is that you can make it even more detailed and longer because as I, as I showed in the first slide, uh, one of the first slides, you want your resume to be one page. But what LinkedIn gives you the opportunity to do is to add media and different elements um, and more details and information. So make sure that you're utilizing as much info and spaces as possible for LinkedIn versus just condensing it to the one page with what you would do for your resume. Um, but one thing to know is that make sure that you guys enter your, the company names correctly because that is how you're going to populate their icons and their logos. And if someone is searching for interns at a specific company or an assistant or specific people at a specific company, the only way they're going to find you is if you have entered the company name correctly. So be sure to, to double check that and, um, and make sure you're doing that correctly. And then you can list multiple companies as one job if you did the same job or freelance work for them. So for example, I worked at CBS Interactive, but within that um, company, I also worked under the Entertainment Tonight umbrella. And so I have them both listed on my profile. You can check out my profile to take a look at that. And then, um, like I said, make sure that you guys are adding the media feature. If you guys are graphic designers or any, anyone who has a portfolio online, you have the option to show and add links to some of your work that um, they can click on and it'll direct them to those uh, websites or portfolio so that you can use that as another way of adding value to your profile. And then your education, be sure to add any additional training or certification, not just where you're going to school for undergrad or grad school, like whatever you're doing, make sure that you add any additional training or certifications. And then your volunteer experience, great place to show how companies and brands and organizations that you worked with. And, you know, don't leave this empty if you've actually done some volunteer work. These are just some examples of what I was mentioning previously. So um, I have my positions listed under experience on, on the far left side of the screen. And then my education and volunteer experience here is at on the right. And, you know, I just have these listed. I don't, I don't leave things out. I, and all the little images that you see under each position, those are media clips. So if you click on that while you're on my profile, it'll direct you to a video file or a page, a document, a PDF, or some sort of a, a, a attachment that is a media file. So those are just adding additional value to each level of experience that I have listed on my profile. All right. So more features, um, the features and skills be very specific in this section. This is a major way that recruiters can find and compare you to other candidates. So what LinkedIn does, is it, it lets you list what you're good at as far as like specific skills. So say, for example, you know how to edit in Photoshop or you know how to edit in Final Cut Pro or you're a writer and you know how to use a specific writing program make sure that you type in those keywords because you can add those within your profile. And if someone is looking to see what skills you have that you may have or may have not listed on your resume or LinkedIn profile, these skills will show up in uh, comparing you to other candidates when uh, employers are looking at you. And then recommendations. This is a great place to show you have you know, created great working relationships and ask others to write recommendations for you, but be very specific in what you would want them to mention. So for example, if you worked at a company or you, know, you did an internship or a project with a, a certain organization and it was for a specific project, when you ask someone to write the recommendation, say specifically to them, like you are, you know, you would love for them to highlight the work that you did on this project. 
And that way that they can speak to that specifically when you go ahead and, um, and they write that recommendation for you so that they're being specific, help them help you <laughs> basically. And then in, under your accomplishments, you know, be as thorough as possible, toot your own horn because really no one else will. This is your profile and you're responsible for listing all the great things that you've done. And then interests as well. Another great way for people to find you, I'll show you guys some examples of, of these on the next slide. So these are some of those sections that I just mentioned, your skills and endorsements, your recommendations, your accomplishments, as well as your interests. So make sure you guys are following Emma Bowen <laughs> because that is listed as a, uh, a page under one of my interests as well. So make sure you guys are following that. So that if people are searching, people are interested in the Emma Bowen Foundation, you might show up too. All right, higher view. So higher view, is a video interview software program that we utilize and other employers utilize. This is one of several ways that people are now transitioning into virtual interviews. And this is a great way for you to, you know, present yourself to the employer virtually. Now, part of this process um, is very important for you. It's very important for you to follow and read and understand the directions and instructions. And those will come in the email that you get from us uh, through the application process. But it is a combination of video questions and written responses. The video questions have a time limit and the written responses have a character limit. So you'll need to be as concise as possible. Share your personality while being specific in your video and written responses and explaining how these relate to your interest in media and tech specifically. We are a media and tech organization. And when we are asking these questions, we wanna know specifically how those relate directly to your interest in this industry. Not that we're asking you, what are your career goals? And you say you wanna you know, own a pet grooming spa. That's great and we love that about you, but we wanna know where you, what are your career goals specifically when it comes to media and tech. So just make sure that when you're answering these questions that you are being specific to what you're applying for. And that's not just with us, but that's with anyone that you're being asked these type of career questions. And then focus on answering these questions as clearly and concisely as possible. If you need to, you know, practice a little bit with some general job questions so that you have like standard, comfortable responses, that's recommended as well. Because we're asking you natural questions that you should have answers to. We just want to see how you're going to respond. But if you need to, you know, practice in the mirror, practice with a friend, that's a good way of getting more comfortable in front of the camera. Okay, here are some specific video interview tips that you can follow when doing your higher view portion of your application. Make sure first that you test your internet connection before starting because you don't want your video or your audio to be interfered. You want it to be a smooth video so that um, you're seen and heard very clearly. And then you wanna turn off other unneeded devices in the home or space that you're in that are utilizing and pulling from your Wi-Fi because that can also affect your video quality as well as your audio quality. Then you wanna have your recording device fully charged and with your charger you know, close by just in case you need it so that you don't run out of power while you're in the middle, middle doing your higher view. And then you wanna make sure that you're framed up properly. This is where I'm positioned now is considered like a medium close-up shot. So make sure that you're not too far away from the camera, you're not too close up in the camera, that you're framed very fairly in the center of the camera and that you are not positioned like out of frame or unevenly within the frame. Make sure that your lighting is good, that you're in a well-lit area from the front. The light that I have in front of me right now is literally in front of my laptop. So there's me, the laptop, and then there's a light, and then I have a light above me. So just make sure that you're positioning your light properly so that you're seen clearly from the front and it's not behind you. Make sure your audio is good as well. We wanna be able to hear you clearly and speak clearly and loudly. Turn off all of the devices, uh, other devices and notifications. So turn off your phone, you know, your cell phone. If you have notifications on your laptop, turn those off while you're doing your higher view. So it's not dinging in the midst of your higher view. Uh, put your phone and devices on, you know, silent 
and then make sure that you're in an area where you're not sitting next to your air conditioner or your windows are not open. Just be mindful of these things because you never know how they can impact and create background noise and interrupt your audio for your higher view. And then make sure that you are dressed appropriately. Your wardrobe and your attire is very important. Be dressed professional, business, business casual. So you are presenting yourself very polished and, and clean and you know ready for the, the, the interview. You don't wanna wear something that's distracting, that's too many colors, or that's taking away from your, your beautiful face. We wanna see you and we wanna hear you clearly. So um, make sure that you are avoiding stripes and busy patterns and dots and things like that. These are just things to be mindful of that you probably won't think of the same way if you were going for an in-person interview, but because there's so much technology involved in it, you want to be mindful of all these specific details because they can interrupt the camera or the audio or things like that. And then relax, enjoy, and remember to be honest and smile during your entire interview process. That's super duper important. We really want to see your personality, who you are, and why you're so excited to be a part of the Emma Bourne Foundation. And that really should shine through. And all the other, other logistic things are important, but we really want to see who you are and how you will fit into what we have to offer. The other thing that's important too is Hire View. Um, they actually have some interview tips as well on their website. So we, um, you can go to their website at hireview.com and click down under the candidate resources and interview tips. And they have a lot of great tips there if you want additional insight before you go ahead and do your actual hire view for us. So that is all of the great information to get you at the top of the line when it comes to presenting yourself during the Emma Bowen Foundation's application process. I hope that that gave you really great insight on how to present yourself, not just to us, but to everyone that you would be considered for when it comes to a job, internship, or anything along your career journey. So I'm here for question and answers, specifically regarding what we discussed during the presentation. And if you guys have any other additional logistic questions, make sure that you guys email all those logistic questions to applications.edf at NBCU. Okay, so let's get into some questions. I'm gonna open up the chat and see, um, and see if there is any other questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, what projects, this is a question from Chanel, I see. What projects should we list on our resume? Can we list a short film that we worked on alone for class or is it usually for more official projects? I would recommend anything that you've dedicated your time, energy and efforts to when it comes to work that you're creating. I think that's a valid opportunity to present that in your application and your resume. You know, you can definitely put that under, you know, freelance work or um, another category. It doesn't have to be under work if you didn't get paid, but even if you didn't get paid for something, doesn't mean that it's not valid, right? So make sure that if it's a project that you worked on, because guess what? You guys are still in school. So we understand and those um, companies, other people who are looking to work with you, we understand that you guys are in the process of getting experience. So we're not expecting you to have a very like extensive experience list. We do want to see the effort though. We want to see that you guys have been doing projects in school and outside of school. So make sure that you guys are listing those on your resume. Even if you didn't get paid for them, it's okay. It's still great work that you contributed to. All right. Should we not use color templates for our resume? Great question. I touched on that a little bit during the resume portion and I would um, advise against that unless your position and what you're interested in going into is, regard, is in the field of design. So if you're a graphic designer, then your resume can reflect a little bit more creatively as to what you wanna do. But if you're applying for finance, marketing, production, writing, you wanna keep it as clean as possible. The whole point of it is to make sure that you're highlighting your skills and experience. It's not to present the fact that you pick the coolest resume template, right? They want to know what you can do because just because you have a beautiful resume doesn't mean that that's going to get you the job. Your skills, your experience, 
and who, how and who you present yourself to them is what's going to get you the job. And what's going to keep you there is the fact that you know what you're doing and that you're eager to work and learn and, you know, and grow within the company. So those are what you want to focus on. Don't worry about picking a colorful template. And I'll, I'll just give you guys an extra tip here is that a lot of companies use what are called applicant tracking systems. And these are software programs that will filter through different resumes before they get to the actual human that needs to filter through them themselves. So if you're applying for a job and you are using a very color blocked or um, graphic designed resume, you may not get filtered through properly via the applicant tracking systems because it's not able to read the text easily. When you're using a white background with 12 times new Roman text, that is super standard and most, most software programs will be able to read that. But when you use all the color blocking and photos and images and things like that and backgrounds, that and different font sizes, that's another thing to keep in mind. Don't use multiple, like too many different types of fonts, uh, styles on your resume. So um, just be mindful of that because there's a whole nother level of technology that is filtering through resumes before you even get to a human. And we wanna make sure you guys get to humans. So keep it simple. The, the format that we showed is really best practice. And if you're doing the great work and have a great experience, that's gonna shine through and that's what matters. So um, let's see how much information, if any, should we include about creative projects we're currently working on? I think you should create the work that, you're, that you've already done. If you're working on a project and it's not complete or it's not like even halfway through, um, then I wouldn't in include that yet. If you just got asked to do something, I wouldn't put that on my resume or LinkedIn. Not until you're almost done or done with the project would I include that on my resume or LinkedIn. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> For the job experience section, should I include jobs that do not correlate with the field I want to pursue in? This is a great question. And the reason why this is a great question is because you always have skills that are applicable to what you want to do. So say you worked in retail, right? But your goal is to work in journalism. What their skills of communicating with people on a daily basis and creating reports and understanding behavior and things like that, that you learn in the retail space that you wouldn't even think are applicable for journalism. But as long as you can correlate the connection between the, the jobs that you've had plus the job that you want to have and explain that and you know explain that clearly when you are doing your cover letter or your summary or things like that that's important that you understand how those tie together and those skills work together just because you work in a field that is not in the field you want to work in doesn't mean that you haven't learned and done great things that are applicable to that next level of your journey so absolutely include them if you understand how to correlate them what are some keywords that hiring officials look for, especially for tech? Well, they're looking specifically a lot of times for your ability to um, work with the specific software programs um, because tech is tech. And if you are um, looking for a role in the engineering side, for example, they wanna make sure that the learning curve that you're gonna have to go through in order to step into that position immediately is not so far off, that you are well-versed in these software programs that are standard for that position in that track of the business. So make sure that you know you are getting the proper training for all of the different programs that you're going to need to do. And um, you know, look, look at job descriptions now. I would encourage you all to make sure that you're reading job descriptions for entry-level positions that you ultimately will want to have once you graduate. Look at some of the things that they're expecting of you. What are the expectations when it comes to experience and learning how to work with other people? The soft skills that we talk about, like look up soft skills. That's Google that, and then that'll help you in a lot of ways. What soft skills are going to be needed, and then what what substantial like logistic skills will you need in some of these positions? Because there's 
thousands of job descriptions out there that will give you this type of insight and that will give you these keywords. And then look at those jobs like you say, oh, ultimately I want to be this in 10 years. Look at that job description. What are the keywords in that job description and how do you bridge the, the or create the bridge from the entry level position to that 10 year position that you ultimately wanna be in? Should we put our references on the resume? No, your references should always be an additional page and they should come via request. One recommendation I have for for references specifically, make sure that your references know that they're references. <laughs> you know, like make sure that they are aware that you are listing them as a reference. And whenever you share your references page with anyone, with an employer, with with us, whomever is requesting that reference page from you, make sure that you give everyone on that page a heads up that, you, that they may be getting an email or a call from someone based off of this specific role. So for example, if I have six references or five references on my reference page, I'm literally going to email every single person, email or call every single person on that reference page before I distribute that to anyone and let them know, hi, such and such, by the way, I hope everything is well. I just wanted to let you know that I recently applied for this position and they asked for my references and I have you listed. If you could please, you know, speak of any highly, you know, uh, experiences we had together when we were working on this project or working at this company, it would be greatly appreciated. I know that they may be reaching out to you in the next 30 days or so. That is a quick note that you can absolutely and should always give your references a heads up before they get a call from someone because they may not even know how to respond. Help people help you. <laughs> that is a theme here. <laughs> so definitely be mindful of that. But don't automatically send it. Don't automatically attach it to your resume. Only send and distribute it when it's requested and have it as a second page, not the main page of your resume. Should retail experience or past experience that aren't EBF media tech friendly be on your resume? I think I answered this already. So yes, if it's applicable. Should a resume be chronologically by starting date or end date? Start date. You put in, you know, when you started to when you're finished. And if you're currently working somewhere, you put your start date plus present. Start to present. Um, Okay, you mentioned first being a part of Emma Bowen in high school. I know once you're in, you're in for life. Yes, <laughs> in the best way possible. So from high school throughout your college career, were you able to receive support in receiving multiple internships through Emma Bowen? So I can speak specifically to my situation. I started as a sophomore in high school at Fox in Chicago, and I stayed with Fox for the full duration of my time in Emma Bowen as an intern and fellow. And then I got hired as a full-time staff employee before I even graduated. So it is, and the goal and what makes us so special is that we are a long-term commitment relationship with the partners that we have. And that's an expectation that we have of you all as well, if you are welcomed into the program, that you're going to stay with that partner for whatever that duration is. If you start as a junior in college or freshman in college, whatever that is, the idea is that you stay with them for the duration and you learn multiple facets at that specific partner company. Whereas in other internships, you're just bouncing all over the place and you're trying to catch whatever information you can. We keep you, you have somewhat of a home in a way, but you're learning every aspect of that business. So for me, I started as a, as a sophomore, freshman in, in uh, sophomore in high school, I'm sorry. And then I worked in every department in the company. Like literally I worked in the general manager's office. I worked in community services. I worked in sales. I worked in the newsroom. I worked in operations. I worked in the sports department, the morning show. I helped launch shows. Like I was literally, I learned every single aspect of that company and how it worked from top to bottom and how everyone worked together before I, you know, decided that my home would be in the newsroom as a writer producer. So for me, it was like, I learned and I could observe what everything that was going on and why each department was important, but what tapped in for me and what came naturally to me was being a writer and producer. So I ultimately stayed in the newsroom once I got down there and just continued to work in that area once I graduated. But I, I know what everybody, I knew what everybody did and why they did it and how they did it. Cause I was with 
them in some capacity. Every summer, every break, I would come back and learn and work in a different department at the same company. So how do you feel about Canva created headers for LinkedIn? I think Canva's amazing. Um, Canva is literally like amazing. It is one of the best online programs to create graphics, um, period, for free, especially. Um, I think if you do something, according to how I showed you guys, if it is appropriate for your industry, like my friend Sean, who had like a radio boom box or something showing, if you can create something that makes sense to what you do in the industry that you're focused on, then fine. I, I support Canva. I think it's amazing. But just keep in mind that you want to be consistent in, you know, showing what you're doing and what you want to do. And if your background can be created in Canva and doing that, then by all means, <laughs> go for it. I'm concerned that my experience isn't enough for some tech jobs. How do I maximize the story of my experience? I hope that makes sense. So um, we, this is a thing. Everyone is, and this is a very interesting job market right now. I think that the level at which most of you all are at right now, the expectation is not that you're going to have 10 years of experience, right? Like the employers and, and, and we know that as well. So we want you all to be as honest with us as possible. We want and encourage you to be as honest with everyone in this, in your journey of your career as possible. And understand that you sometimes have to deep dive into what you've done as experience. So if you worked as an assistant somewhere or you know, an entry level engineer somewhere and you learned all these skills, don't just take that job description that you entered the company with as all that you've done. Hopefully while you were there, you expanded those responsibilities and you built off of that and you were you know, showing great work ethic and they gave you more responsibilities. Keep, and this is something that I just suggest to all of those and especially to you all at this level of your career, create what I call a historical timeline of your experience. And this is a master document that you can always go back and reference. It's not to be distributed, shared with anyone. You know, if you're sitting with someone that's helping you with your resume or LinkedIn, then yes, of course. But it's not something that you send out ever. Um, it's, it's basically going to keep track of all of your work, meaning job experience you got paid for, uh, freelance work you did, part-time work volunteer, any sort of contract, any work that you've done in the area of your career, you keep like a long running historic history of all of your work. And this is great for a couple of reasons. But one of the main reasons is when you go to tailor your resume, because you're always going to tailor your resume every time you apply for a job, right guys? <laughs> Make sure you are doing that. But this makes it easy. So every time you go to adjust your resume, for each job you're applying for, you go back to this master document and that document is literally like a copy and paste and some tweaking and double checking of words and things like that, um, finessing from there. It's not like you're recreating your resume over and over and over again. Like that's like a super tip because I know when we tell you that you need to re like tailor your resume every time for every job, that sounds like a lot of work, but if you're keeping this historical timeline of all of the things that you've done, because you're going to do some amazing things and you're going to forget some of them. <laughs> but if you're doing this after every, every time you, when you finish a project, you can literally like just copy and paste or copy, paste and adjust, right? You're not recreating a resume from scratch. You're basically just building off of what you use as your historical timeline, if that makes sense. Um, so back to your initial question about, you know, your experience is like, you're going to continue to build and grow. I would recommend to you guys, don't wait for a job to do what you want to do. I'm going to say that again. Don't wait for a job to do what you want to do. If you want to create apps on iPhone and Android, get training, do some training. There's all sorts of like classes you can take at your schools that you're at, as well as like online, you can teach yourself how to, you know, program and engineer and build apps and things like that. Show initiative before you even get the job. Show initiative before you even have to, you know, like present yourself to anyone. And one thing that I always recommend <clears throat> sometimes to candidates that are applying for creative work and also engineering work and design work. Um, my little brother's probably you guys' age. 
he's a graphic designer and he didn't have any experience. He had like a couple of freelance jobs that he had done, but no major work experience. And he got a job at a, at a large advertising agency as a graphic designer recent, like literally in the past two weeks. And I walked him through the whole process of that, but he didn't understand the, the etiquette of the process because he'd never been through it before. But I definitely feel like you guys don't, don't hold yourself back. Don't cancel yourself out because you don't have everything that's listed in that job description. If you know that you can teach yourself some of these skills next time that opportunity presents itself, start teaching yourself that. Start doing that. And, and when you get the opportunity for the interview and you get like into level one, level two, level three, level four, because there's multiple levels to these interview processes, such as it is with us. When you get into the job space, you're going to have levels to these interviews. Make sure that you are prepared. And if you're asked to, you know, meet with the creative director at an advertising agency, have like some, some examples done, like mock up some stuff and present that to your next level of your interviews. No one's stopping you from creating anything. Create without having a job associated with it. Do the work before you get the job. And I promise you, it will help you get the job. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Um, how can we learn to be concise during our higher view interview? Practice, 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 practice. Like write down what you think you want to say. Um, some of the like basic career questions, like why do you want to be a part of Emma Bowen? That's a general question. I'm not making up these general questions. We have a list of questions that we will provide to you. But what I'm saying is like, think logically from the perspective of why do I wanna do this in the first place? Why am I passionate about this? What is my ultimate short-term goal? And what do I wanna learn from this experience? And then where do I ultimately see myself in 10 years? These are like basic life career questions, right? If you write the answers to those, just those or even more out, and then you practice presenting those to camera. You can record yourself. You can talk to a friend. You can, you know, practice in a mirror, do whatever. That is how you're going to get more concise because what that's going to do for you is it's going to let you hear yourself say some of the things that you're thinking. And then you're going to understand what needs to be taken out and what's unnecessary. You're going to hear your ums and oops and ahs. And uh, you're going to hear all the inflections. You're going to hear your tone. You're going to notice when you're smiling, when you're not smiling, how it sounds differently. Like this is, these are all human behavior things that come off in your interview. And you don't want to just be like stiff and nervous and uncomfortable because that comes off very clearly on, on camera as well. So you want to make sure that you're practicing practice. That is the best way for you to get concise. That is the best way for you to get comfortable. That is the best way for you to get confident in front of camera is to practice, practice, practice. Okay. If we are interested in opportunities in two of three concentrations, should we select our top concentration and mention our interest in the others as well? Or should we pick one to commit to? Um, I think at this stage of the game, we know you're going to have multiple interests, but we want to understand where your focus is. So I would say, yes, lead with your top choice, lead with your top choice and say that you have interest in other areas, but make sure you are leading with focus. We want to know and understand where your journey may lead you to. And when you have focus, that will help us know the best place to position you because different companies are going to provide different opportunities and have different timings of openings um, in different departments and things like that. And so it helps us help you when you can give us a guide and a lead as to where your main focus is and then maybe second and third interest. But tell us everything, but you have to give us a focus to work with for sure. Um, what is your opinion on any interest section on an interest section of your resume and should it remain professional or include professional interests? I think, again, correlating. If you do um, volunteer work at a community center, right? This is like an interest section. This is something that could go in your interest section. If you do volunteer work at a community center and you're teaching young kids how to, you know, speak Spanish or, you know, write or create a broadcast, these are interests, you know, different things. I say keep it professional and make sure that whatever you're including in your interests correlate to your professional work that you want to do. Because why else would you put it on there if there's no correlation? 
If it correlates, then it makes sense. If it doesn't, then keep it off. You know, we want to know that you're well-rounded and that you're doing things in the community and in the world that are outside of just you working, but we want to understand why you're doing them and how they're correlating. If you're teaching, you know, or if you're volunteering, you know, on the weekends at a surf school, then that's one thing. But why are you doing that? Like, we want to understand the why behind it, not just the, the fact that you like to do pottery and surf and, you know, roller skate and rollerblade. You understand what I'm saying? Like, make sure that there's there's logic explanation as to these interests and when and why you put them on your resume and your LinkedIn profile. Okay, a few more questions and then we're going to wrap up because we are almost at time. Um, what is your, okay, let's see. If students are interested in interning with a specific partner company, how should they go about expressing that if at all? Does it make them appear narrow-minded or driven? Now, this is a logistical question because, um, because our team at EBF is going to decide with, which partner company you will be going with. That's not a decision that we that I would make on this call at all. So that is a logistic question. I would absolutely definitely send that to that email applications.ebf at nbcuni.com. Make sure that you email that there. I will say this and just, you know, my opinion about you expressing interest in a specific company. I think it's great. I think you should tell us if you would like to work with a specific company, but but be available and open and humble to work with whomever you are partnered with because you never know why you are placed in a certain place. You're always placed somewhere for a reason. I don't believe anything happens by mistake when it comes to your divine journey if your intention is, is genuine and pure, right? If you're on that track, then everything's gonna happen for a reason. And there may be a company that you are positioned with and partnered with if you get this opportunity, which is an amazing life-changing opportunity, that you didn't even realize was going to change your life in the way that it did. So be open-minded. You know, you could have like a specific company in mind, like, oh my gosh, I want to work there. It seems amazing. I know all the work that they do. Great. If you get that, great. If you don't, be excited as well. Be excited that you're even a part of the experience and opportunity. That's what I would say. Um, between the online application form and the hire view video, you can discuss, oh, that's Crystal. You guys are answering questions. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, okay, cool. I think we got it. I think we did it in an hour. Guys, I don't know if there's any more questions, um, but I am super duper happy that you guys, again, took the time to be with us today to, you know, uh, step into your time and, uh, and learn about how you can present your best self to us and the world. And I'm really excited for you guys the foundation changed my life in ways that I can't even explain. You know, I've been in this business forever and it's literally changed my life. So I would say congrats to you for even being interested and ready and focused on this track. It is an opportunity of a lifetime for you all. If you get it, I wish you all the best. Make sure that you guys connect with me on social. I'm just Naina Drake everywhere, basically <laughs> on LinkedIn, you know, wherever. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions and help you guys if you're here. And when you graduate from college or, you know, from EBF, you will be welcomed into the uh, AMP network, which I'm the director of. And so again, you can just get more of one-on-one -on -one time with me if you are in that community as well. But that is for those who have graduated college. So if you guys are still in school, you'll still be a part of it. But whether you, whether you make it through to be an EBF uh, fellow or not, you can still join as soon as you graduate college and you can get Ask me all the questions you want. <laughs> I do this all day. I talk to people and help them navigate their journey all day. So I'm, I'm honored and so blessed and thankful to be able to share what I know with you guys and pour into you. But connect with me and let me know if you have any other questions. But thank you guys so, so much. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Michael, if you're still there. <laughs> I am here. Sorry, Naina, to leave you here. Uh, um, no, but like Naina said, thanks to everyone. We will be sharing the recording and we really appreciate you guys taking this time to join us and try and learn a little bit more about how you can stand out 
But of course, biggest thanks to Naina for sharing that awesome info throughout. This was fun. We will see you all in the EBF application cycle or beyond. Good luck. Good luck starting your semester. And uh, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>